All right. So we are live on Facebook. Uh, thank you, Ilman and Valdevji, for joining us for our part six of our anti-hate conversation series. Uh, my name is Samia Hassan, and I'm the executive director of the Council of Agencies Serving South Asians. Um, before we get started, just wanted to do a quick land acknowledgement. The work of the Council of Agencies Serving South Asians takes place on traditional indigenous territories of the Huron Windat, the Haudenosaunee, and the territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. This territory is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, an agreement between the Ashinabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This territory is also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. Today, Takaranto, the traditional Mohawk name of this area called Toronto, meaning a gathering place and its surrounding areas are still home to Indigenous people and we're grateful to have the opportunity to meet, work, and play on this territory as settlers. So today's session, uh, we're going to be continuing um, our session uh, on racism within racialized communities and the need for solidarity. And uh, we will focus a little bit on um, discussing anti-racism with elders in our communities. Uh, so we'll make it specific to uh, racialized communities, and we'll talk a little bit about nuances within the South Asian communities as well. So we have uh, today Baldev Mutta and Ilmana Fasi as our guests for today's session. Um, and a quick bio of the two guests before we um, have a discussion with them. Dr. Ilmana Fasi works at the United Way Greater Toronto and leads the South Asian Advisory Council with past 22 years of experience as a practicing gynecologist back home, she's, passion, she's a passionate activist of social justice and women's rights. She is the founder of Your Storyteller, an innovative digital comic book platform to share true stories of common people. For a hobby, she blogs and paints on silk. She uses art as a medium to convey empowerment, peace, and diversity. Thank you, Amana, for joining us. Well, Dave Mutta has been in the field of social work for the past 45 years. He is the founder and chief executive officer of the Punjabi Community Health Services. He has worked for the last 28 years developing an integrated holistic model to address substance abuse, mental health, and family violence in the South Asian communities. He has received many community awards for his work on equity, diversity, community development, and organizational change. Um, so this series, if you're tuning in for the first time, is part of CASA's ongoing anti-hate work that we do in collaboration with our anti-hate community leaders group. These sessions take place every Tuesday at four o'clock uh, that you can either watch them here on Facebook Live or you can, um, if you don't have Facebook, then you can go to YouTube. Um, and once the sessions finish, we upload them directly on YouTube. And so uh, I forget to mention this after every session, this is the sixth week we're doing it. So I finally remembered today to mention that if you have any questions for the panelists, um, if you can comment in the comment box on Facebook before 420. So if you can uh, pose your questions before 420, we'll try to incorporate them in our discussion. Obviously, because it's such a short time span that we have, um, we want to get as much out of this conversation as possible. So we'll do our best. Uh, but I just wanted to put it out there moving forward. If anybody has any questions, they can try posting it in the comment box. So um, as I mentioned last week, for the next couple of weeks, we will be focusing on uh, solidarity. Uh, we will be focusing on issues of racism within racialized communities. And we will uh, talk about how to dismantle systemic racism, anti-Black anti racism, and anti-Indigenous racism within our communities and within our societies. So we'll get right into it. Um, so the first question is a little bit about um, some cultural context. So uh, some people ask me why we are particularly focusing on elders in this conversation. Um, so why don't people just go up to their parents or their grandparents and say, hey, you're being racist, stop being racist. So I wanted to get your sense of what nuances exist in, you know, particularly the South Asian culture when you know, having these kind of tough discussions with elders and parents. Um, what does that context look like? And can you tell us that, you know, just uh, why just approaching parents and grandparents and saying something bluntly may or may not work? Uh, so, mind you, go ahead first. Okay. So, uh, Samia, um, I think this is a very important and a very neglected uh, group of individuals that we are talking about. Uh, uh, they are part of our family 
and we have to come with an with an understanding that being uh, most of us as racialized communities are very family oriented could sometimes be living in multi generational families together and there may be differences of opinion between different generations which we called as uh, generation gaps and uh, there is always a continuous conversation across the dining table or uh, with different individuals it is sometimes related to culture sometimes related to faith and uh, what we need to understand is where are our seniors coming from we need to know uh, that most of them uh, have had a colonial uh, exposure so they come from a very co a colonized mindset and a lot of them have been uh, first generation or parents of first generation uh, uh, individuals in canada if we talk of this context so they are not aware of uh, black history that is one of the very important things for them to uh, for anybody to appreciate the the uh, black community's sacrifices we need to know what have they gone through and third i think they are a little insecure which i have seen in some cases uh, uh, i am a mother and a grandmother too but uh, somehow i i am an outlier i don't seem to be uh, insecure but a lot of people i've seen are very insecure they want to they they want their future generations to hold on to culture and their faith and in doing so they try to push back other cultures and other faiths and as if it's like you know uh, um either me or them it's not anything of that sort so we need to understand where are they coming from but the conversations are important and we need to have those conversations in the sense that it it should come from a uh, lens of understanding where are they uh, why are they what they believe in and that if we have to maintain a dialogue which has to be very uh, respectful and compassionate Thank you. Well, Devji? Uh, my take on it is, uh, is uh, that we have uh, not really understood internalized racism uh, ever since India and Pakistan became independent countries. We have never really deconstructed as to what is our new identity. <clears throat> we are still struggling to define our identity, whether we are defining it based on our constitution or whether it's based on some other uh, entity. It could be religion, it could be culture, it could be something else. So from, the, from that perspective, I think we have really not dismantled and held those people accountable which collaborated with the Br uh, British during our freedom movement. So we have not really dismantled education system. We have not dismantled the police system of oppression. We have not dismantled the bureaucratic system that was entrenched to oppress people. So we just you know, built on it and we just you know, continued as if life is just fine. And I think that has led us to certain critical uh, way of our uh, uh, psyche, which was predominantly that we have a different segment of our populations oppressed. They could be Dalits, they could be marginalized communities in India, for example, uh, untouchables, uh, Muslim community, Sikh community, Kashmiris on this side, or some other migrant laborers from Bihar, and we have some derogatory language towards different uh, uh, geographic regions, and everything kind of no continued and nobody made a big deal about it and nobody critiqued it the education system continued the same way the police system of oppression continued and we have a particular mindset where we tolerated a lot of oppression so when we come here that oppression takes a different form altogether so from being you no know, brutal kind of you no know, oppression now it became a civilized oppression so it takes us a couple of years to even understand oh so we are being discriminated Oh, so this is a systemic discrimination. Nobody tells us to our face that we should not leave Canada. And that kind of a thing is very rarely done. But what is very often done is 
systemic discrimination. You're not being promoted. You're not being hired. Uh, foreign uh, uh, graduates in medical system cannot become doctors here because they have to go through so many loops and holders. Finally, they have to give up and they you know, do some other uh, kind of you know, thing. We, we have not deconstructed our own oppression. And so we really don't have a language whereby we can sit down and we can say, well, do you know that these people have been oppressed for so long? It's just like the Dalits have been oppressed for so long in the Indian subcontinent. So we have a hierarchy when in Islam there is no hierarchy, in Sikhism there is no hierarchy. And yet when you look at cultural uh, kind of a thing, people are discriminating. Okay, so you are this particular Muslim, you are this particular Sikh, you are a better Sikh and you are a better Muslim. And these people are not, not, not good enough Muslims and these are not good enough Sikhs. And I think those are some challenges that we bring with us. And so we Alien, we do not participate in the bigger movement. And so we have no vocabulary. We have no mechanism to deconstruct anything. So we just don't talk about it. We don't talk with our children. We don't talk with our elders. Husband and wife don't talk about it. And, and they just you know, look at the news and they say, Baut mada hoya. Changi gal ki. this is not good. Ye aisa nahi hona tha. And that's all what we say. And, and there is no other way to kind of you know, engage the family in a dialogue as to what racism is. How does it affect us? Does their struggle, is that any different from our struggle? And, and when you ask them, well, Canada is, was built on racism and it was you know, very oppressive to the South Asian community. And a lot of people are you know, uh, 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 very surprised when you talk about Kamagata Maru, when you talk about the exclusion, when you talk about the head attacks, and when you talk about many, uh, many other uh, immigration acts that were so prejudiced and racist towards communities like the Chinese community and the black community and all this. Right? So people just don't, haven't even taken the time to really understand this. And I think that's where we as a community need to really learn a lot as to what other communities have and even learn our own history as to how we, our forefathers in Canada in 1897 and subsequently, how we were being marginalized all these years and where are we now in all, this, uh, all these terms in terms of the struggles that we have lack of no with with whatever happens with the peel district school board for example it's an excellent example it's in front of us it's it's not something remotely happening in georgia or in atlanta it's happening in peel and with Toronto district school board within certain things and i think those are the issues that we need to kind of know really talk about it and what do you think um so those are the some of the kind of the cultural um histories um, that can act as barriers. But what do you think, um, are, are there communication barriers between um, younger people and elders? Um, just like generally, not even talking about anti-racism, what are those communication barriers? I think, I think most of these communication barriers are uh, which we have been, when conveying a lot of our general uh, uh, values also across generations. Uh, one is how we perceive this society. Kids who have been going here from junior kindergarten to high school to university have a very different perception of this community as compared to those who are either who, uh, us as first generations or even parents who've just come here as retired individuals. Um, language itself is a barrier. Uh, a lot of uh, our children are not very well versed in uh, fluent in their own um, mother tongue and the parents and the grandparents are not that fluent in English, then there are those biases that, oh, these are old individuals. They have cemented ideas. They won't understand. Some of it may be true as well, but then it is how we present those ideas, how we communicate and communication is extremely powerful. If we communicate it properly, that can get through and make them understand. Another barrier, I think, is uh, awareness of history, which probably is a barrier for, I would say, a lot of individuals, even those who have grown up here, 
because unless you really have that angle of social justice, there are a lot of issues like the um, residential schools or a lot of uh, discriminatory history that has happened, whether it was the Afric will of uh, uh, Nova Scotia or the uh, Black uh, uh, Wall Street of uh, Tulsa, we, none of this is taught in schools. So unless the youth and the individuals are really up to social justice and understand, it is very difficult for them also to understand so that they are able to uh, convey it to their seniors. Veji, do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, I think one of the challenges within our community also is that we don't have a, a forums created within our community. For example, our uh, media outlets within our community are not talking about uh, powerfully about how do we link ourselves with the black community in some and and show some kind of a solidarity. Uh, reading a news that this particular thing has happened doesn't automatically synchronize with the South Asian community because it's a news. There's many news that you read on uh, on a on a particular uh, radio program, but that's a news. In order for them to kind of you know, take it to the next level means that you're you are taking your responsibility as a media of education and awareness, which means now we will have to talk about, okay, how do we show solidarity between the South Asian community and the black community? What can we work together? How can we work together? I think that discussion is absent within our community at many levels. It's absent within the religious uh, uh, the institutional structures, it's absent, it's absent within the media, and it's absent in the cultural organizational kind of you no know, a platform. So for example, within the Punjabi community, there are a lot of Tiyanda Mela, a couple of thousand people kind of you know, log in and they, they talk about it. But they don't talk about any of these issues that are uh, of, of significance to them. So to celebrate uh, one's culture is absolutely, it's necessary, keep on doing it, nobody is against it. But then if you don't uh, uh, acknowledge these kind of uh, issues that are earth shaking, that, uh, uh, that are uh, a kind of you no know, dismantling uh, institutional racism for everyone because once you once you uh, defund police or once you hold police officers accountable you are benefiting whether you like it or not the entire community will benefit from it doesn't matter what your status is so from that perspective i think we have always taken a step back Perhaps we have really not understood how to participate in the civic kind of you know, responsibilities and duties in Canada. And that is where I think we need to kind of you know, play a better role as a, a South Asian Canadian. How do we participate in the civic responsibilities of Canada and building a better Canada than what we inherited when we came, whichever year we came? Mm -hmm. I would like to add a little bit to this, um, Samia. One of the biggest barriers I also think uh, for our seniors or elders in the community is free media. We watch a lot of this media. I mean, our uh, uh, individuals who are retired or who have come here as parents um, of people working here, they engage into the Desi media of their own language. And unfortunately, that, la that media has not been talking a lot about all these social justice issues. They are still more obsessed about what's happening back home. I think at the moment, I am actually a huge fan of CNN. The way they talk of social justice, the way they are filling the gap of leadership in US through their own uh, anchors, some of them at least, I'm really uh, Don Lemon and Chris uh, Como and all. Mm -hmm. They talk bluntly about uh, systemic racism. I, I have counted at least 10 times do these people talk in one single show about systemic racism. We need to understand them. And I'm sure a lot of us um, can watch English uh, channels and understand. And, and it is very important to relate to these uh, mainstream channels to understand what happens in North America. So, so now we've uh, kind of um, drawn this picture of um, some of the backgrounds, the barriers, uh, the history 
So keeping this in mind, um, now let's kind of zone in on what we need to do. So how do we approach now our parents and our elders with the situation that we have currently? Uh, I, I think a, a couple of things we can do. One is we need to have an honest conversation. Second, I think the conversation, uh, even if there is a, a different uh, of opinion or if there are disagreements, I think we need to kind of you know, maintain uh, uh, a, a a kind of a respectful environment when we kind of you know, talk to our elders. It really doesn't matter what the elders view is. If you respectfully put your view forward with some facts and figures, I think to that extent, they're able to understand as to what the issues are. And the third thing I think is that uh, we need to value the uh, the uh, rising or the upliftment of collective consciousness of our community. Individually, we can be whoever we are, but unless the whole consciousness of a community rises up, I think no meaningful change can come in. So we have seen our own struggles within the South Asian community. And I think that if we uh, kind of you know, learn from somebody else's struggle, how they have survived, how they have made a change, how they have endured. Uh, I think to that extent, it will benefit us when we are fighting against our own uh, internal prejudices. Um, I'm a huge, uh, Samia, uh, fan of storytelling. And I have seen this with my children as well and with my own uh, peers and parents that if you really tell uh, personalized stories, it makes a lot of difference. Uh, recently, I was talking to a very close friend of mine uh, from the black community on phone. And we spent about an hour talking and uh, I was basically just listening to her. And uh, the uh, on the other side, she was talking and then she was crying. So when I put down the phone, I had an, uh, uh, an aunt and her daughter, my cousin and her mother visiting us um, uh, recently. Um, so uh, our building allows two people to, to come in. So they had come for um, to visit us. And so we were talking. She said, what happened, Dilmana? I said, you know, this uh, friend of mine was talking about uh, George Floyd. And she said, you know, when, when he was seeing Mama, Mama, uh, I was hearing my son. And then I told her how many of my black colleagues actually express fears of their growing adolescent sons. Yeah. And I could see the, uh, you know, the stare in the eyes of uh, that pupo of mine. Looking at me, she said, really, does that happen? I said, yeah, that is what the reality is. So then she understood and she started relating how George Floyd was killed for just $20. And also, you know, when you make that connection as a mother or as a real individual being fearful of that, I think it makes, a, it makes some difference. These are small little things that can impact. Another thing, uh, the same friend of mine uh, who was telling me was uh, Ilmana, Always, if you f find people around you, whether it's your loved ones or any friends, talking in racist language, counter them immediately because silence is enabling racism. Just counter them in whatever way you think is appropriate, whatever way you think is going to help them. And then there was another, uh, I was uh, watching, I watch a lot, I'm watching a lot of TED Talks these days. So there was a psychologist, he said, the best way to counter uh, these kind of, you know, hard biases is ask them questions. If they will say things like, you know, somebody from that community, they are uh, like that, then you, you, you can ask them, oh, really? Have you seen every single person of that community being unlawful or being a school dropout or something? It could be for any community because we do a lot of that racism within our communities also. We have Hyderabadis talking of Biharis, Biharis talking of Diliwalas. It's not even uh, different race colors. So, you know, you just have to challenge. Do you think every Hyderabadi does that? Or do you think every black person does that? Or do you think every... Um, Hindu or every Muslim does that, you know, you just throw the question in them and then challenge their bias, then they won't have any answer to that. 
so i think these are some of the tactics that i have learned recently and i think the learning is still going on we 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 have to learn all the time how to uh, express our uh, indignation towards these racist things and we have to keep talking and um both of you mentioned um faith and the role of faith in these conversations how does that um play a role um in talking about anti racism in think, the most go ahead baldev ji oh, j- just a brief comment because i know that time is short in my thing is that there are some uh uh learned people within the religious institutions that can link religion to the practical problems of the society they are very good at it they have concept uh, that they can relate to unfortunately there are many other individuals who are in control of religious institutions and they are unable to take the religious teachings and link them to the ground level reality and i think that's where we need to have more people within the religious institutions that are able to link whatever the knowledge is within that religion and link it to the practical daily problems of the society and 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 encourage them to participate to make the change whatever is needed that would be uh, i think there is a little bit of no disconnect within our three major religions in uh, a, within the south asian uh, subcontinent and i think that's where we need people who are really knowledgeable not only in their religion but how do you link that nuggets to the practical as i think that's what would be a a better way to look at it um uh, luckily samia coming from uh, a faith which talks about uh, racism very openly which has historical uh, stories of uh, hazrat bilal being a black uh, person who was the favorite um, of prophet muhammad for uh, uh like convey you know, sp- saying the azan then he himself in the last um, khutba talked about uh, racism and that there there is no uh, discrimination there is no uh, supremacy of a white over non white or an arab over non arab but unfortunately it it's not that because of this uh, racism does not exist in our communities within the muslim communities and i've lived in arab world and i've seen uh light skinned arabs discriminating against dark skinned arabs and so unfortunately uh, despite the religious uh, teachings uh there is a lot of uh, practically uh, existent racism across the board in south asia we we conveniently um uh, say this is related to our caste um, uh, casteism that is uh, prevalent in 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 that subcontinent but then it it does come in arab world as well and i think along with the for seniors we can talk about it through religion but i think uh, in general we have to speak in terms of humanity and we have to explain and plus we have to have leadership as baldev ji said who look at it from a humanitarian lens and then also intersect it with religion to see how the religions and the humanity do not contradict each other mm-hmm. and so just one last question before we end so what is um the importance of having these conversations so you know um and amara you mentioned at the beginning that this is kind of the uh, segment of the population that is often forgotten when we're involving people in important discussions what is um the importance of involving elders how does that bring change in our communities Uh, i think the benefit is uh, because seniors do talk and now they are uh, uh, connected virtually i think that if we can have these topics through a zoom uh, within the seniors groups uh, and i know that indus community runs many groups pchs runs many groups and many other organizations within our community in greater toronto area vaughan and all these sub- suburbs they they have seniors virtual wellness groups if we start a campaign of not talking about 
how do we bring solidarity? And I think seniors would love to develop some skits. They would love to write poetry. They would love to have short stories. And I can guarantee you they will come up with some brilliant ideas about how do we as a South Asian uh, elders bond with uh, uh, elders from other communities as well. I think that that should be a project for us to kind of deliver how elders from two communities unite together to develop some kind of a solidarity. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that and I totally agree with you. Um, if you remember that um, last year we did a series uh, of workshops on indigenous environmental justice uh, with seniors at PCHS and the feedback we received was they um, really, um, they loved it and they said, please come back and do more of these. Um, they were listening to, you know, the stories from our indigenous speakers. Um, they were listening to the oppression and the food insecurity that they're facing and they couldn't believe that yeah. this is happening in Canada. They didn't know. And when they found out, like you could see the empathy um, in them and they wanted to do more. So I totally agree that, um, you know, we should do something like that. Amana, do you have a, a last few words to say before we close? Um, again, for the benefit of it, I think, there's nothing like uh, the feeling that your elders understand your point of view and it holds the youth and the second and third generation bound together, mm -hmm. happy, and it reduces conflicts. So uh, I would suggest to seniors is to go out of their way to understand where the youngsters are coming from and pay a serious uh, thought to what they are saying instead of presuming that what they think is right and what the youngsters things are, think are wrong. Thank you so much. Um, I actually myself learned a lot from, from the both of you today. So uh, I really appreciate you uh, both being here today. Um, so that's all the time that we have. Uh, obviously, we will be back next week. Uh, we are going to take a break the week after as it's uh, the day uh, right after um, or the day right before Canada Day. So we'll do one session next week and then we'll take a break and come back in July. Um, but next week we will continue to focus on racism within racialized communities. Uh, and we'll be exploring a little bit on um, some of the work that's ongoing with allyship and community building um, in the South Asian community. I know we've kind of lectured the community um, for the last couple of sessions, but for some um, a different take on it for some good news um, and for some ways for the community to get involved, we'll be bringing in um, some organizations and networks that are doing some allyship work. Uh, so thank you, Almana. Thank you, Valdeji, for joining us. And we hope to see you again next week. Thank you.